Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 3rd of April, 2022, and a lot of updates this week. As always, if this is useful, please go ahead and like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new updates. Also, always as usual, we have the bookmarks down below so you can jump to a particular update you care about maybe more than others. New videos this week. So I created a video all about the generation two virtual machines and the capability that enables IE trusted launch. So if you're interested in that feature to get some additional security, um, check that out. And then yes, for April Fool's Day, uh, I created a video on Project Quantum Leap, zero network latency, uh, no matter what the distance. So you can go and check that out there. So let's get on to the new features. So on the compute side, Azure Batch now has spot VM support. Remember, Azure regions have huge amounts of capacity that's unused because it has to be there when people will say, hey, I want to go and create 100 virtual machines. Well, rather than have it idle, spot VMs let you use that capacity at a greatly reduced price, but you can be basically evicted off of that capacity if regular pay-as-you-go gets it. So you get it much, much cheaper, but your workload has to be stoppable and then resumable. Well, if that matches, Azure Batch can now run on spot virtual machines. Capacity reservations have gone GA. So capacity reservations, remember the idea that, hey, in a particular region for a particular exact SKU, I want to reserve that capacity now. So I start paying for it. And then when I wanna actually create the resource to use it, I create it into that capacity reservation to ensure there's not maybe a capacity issue when I try and provision and create my resource. This might be useful, for example, DR scenarios. I wanna make sure this critical workload can always start in the event of a disaster recovery. Well, with that, Azure Site Recovery capacity reservation support has gone GA. So now that whole idea of, hey, replicating the storage of a virtual machine, at the time I create that ASR, I can create a capacity reservation group at the same time or use an existing one. Just really having that idea of in the event of that disaster, the capacity would definitely be available to me. ACE v1 and ACE v2 will be retiring the end of August 2024. So this is the app service environment that deploys into your virtual network that doesn't have any shared components. Uh, so basically we need to move to the ACE v3 before then. ACE v3 actually has some really nice things separating the communications it requires for its own function from the client data communication requirements. It kind of splits that networking for you and does a lot of other great things, faster provisioning, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of retirements for the N series, basically the original sets of Ns are all retiring end of August 2023, just like other things get to a newer version before then. AKS node auto drain is in preview. So when there's planned maintenance, there are notifications sent through the instance metadata service, the IMDS, to say, hey, this scheduled event is coming. So now AKS nodes, when they receive those notifications of that scheduled maintenance pending, they can do an auto drain. So pods, for example, can be moved off and started on other nodes to minimize any impact to my workload. AKS dedicated host support is in preview. Normally the hosts are workloads deployed to a multi-tenant. I may have scenarios where I don't want to share a piece of physical hardware. So dedicated hosts, I basically buy out the box. I buy out the capacity, which is a certain SKU that supports certain SKUs of virtual machines. And then I've bought out that entire capacity. I put whatever size VMs within that SKU onto those boxes. So now my AKS nodes in my node pools can use dedicated hosts in preview. Also AKS has that capacity reservation support. So hey, I have those capacity reservations. I can consume that capacity that I've reserved for my nodes in my node pools. AKS now has Calico network policy support in GA. So if I think about network policy is all about the idea of rules. 
I have rules that I apply to endpoints in my AKS cluster so that based on certain labels, I can have micro segmentation, control of the flow of traffic. The Calico network policy supports both Linux and Windows, so that's now available in GA. There is also a native Azure network policy implementation that I might want to use instead, but my understanding is that is Linux only today. And then Azure Functions now has Node.js 16 support in GA. That's for all of the 4.0 runtime hosting plans. And Azure Batch has a new simplified communication model. That's in preview, but it will become the standard. Today, there are various inbound rules I have to open up. For example, in my NSGs, there are certain outbound rules I have to open up. In this new simplified model, I only require one outbound rule, 443 TCP, so it's encrypted, going to a batch node management specific region service tag. All of the other inbound and outbound rules will no longer be required. So this really simplifies that whole networking for my Azure batch communications. On the networking side, so as a Azure Bastion native client has gone GA. So this is the idea, instead of having to use the portal, I can use my AZ CLI to kick off the communication that then uses, for example, the native RDP client, MSTSC, or I can use my native SSS, SSH client. I can also use file copy via this. For RDP, it's just my regular clipboard. If I'm using SSH, I can use SCP in the tunnel I establish but now that native client support has gone GA. So remember, Azure Bastion is the whole idea of a, basically a managed jump box service. The new Azure front door has gone GA. So this is the new offering that has a standard and premium tier. It takes what was front door, giving me that fantastic any cast, all of these edge locations, split TCP for great performance, and combines it with the web application firewall, with the CDN functionalities, and a whole bunch of other great things. So now this new version has gone GA. And bring your own IP has gone GA. Up until this point, the only public IPs I could have, well, are the ones that I take from the Azure pools of addresses. Maybe I already have a service on a public IP and that IP is special, it's not DNS based. I need that IP. I can now bring a contiguous prefix, um, a tw slash 24 is the minimum I can bring. I can bring that to a specific Azure region. So it's gonna be bound to a particular region. I can then use that custom prefix that I'm bringing in with then standard public IPs, um, prefixes that I create in that Azure region in my subscription. It is a multi-phase process, because firstly, I have to prove and validate I own those IPs. So that's a check against the registrar for the IPs. Then I have to provision, which is where I actually create a public IP or a IP prefix from that particular custom prefix that I've created. And then finally, I have to commission it. At the point I commission it, that is when it will actually start to get advertised out via the Microsoft WAN and will actually be reachable. So I, I can do this, it's IPv4 only today. Again, a minimum of a slash 24, but I can now bring my own IPv4 block. If the region supports availability zones, I either have to bring it in as zone redundant or zonal. It cannot just be regional. On the storage side, so Azure Databox can now do a direct to archive tier. So remember Azure Databox is this box that gets shipped to you. I copy my data to it, the SMB, NFS. I ship it back to the data center. And then the data I copied to it gets brought into whatever storage accounts I selected when I did the um, provisioning of the data box via the portal. Well, storage has tiers hot call archive. Remember, archive is that offline tier. It's super, super cheap, but I have to bring it out of archive into call or hot to actually read it. Well, now I can have that data from the data box go directly to that archive. So maybe I just have a huge amount of on-premise data. I need to keep it, but I don't want to have to mess around bringing it into call or hot and then move it into archive. 
was part of the provisioning of the data box, I can say, hey, I just want it to go to archive directly. AWS Gen 2, so the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, which is built, remember, on Blob, now has time-based lifecycle management. So based now, for example, on the last access time, I could have lifecycle rules to move the data between tiers. Hey, it's not been accessed for 30 days, move it to call. Hey, it's not been accessed for 90 days, delete it. So I can now do those lifecycle rules based on last access for my Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. Classic storage accounts, uh, retiring end of August 2024, hopefully you're not using those anymore. And Ultradisk is now in Sweden Central in GA. Ultradisk is that top tier storage offering, whereas standard hard disk drives, SSD, premium SSDs have this pretty much a, a fixed capacity performance line. With Ultradisk, I have independent dials, I have capacity, IOPS throughput, I can change that IOPS and throughput independent of the capacity, and I can change it dynamically. Hey, the disk is being used. Hey, I've got a big workload about to hit it. Let's turn up the IOPS or turn up, turn up the throughput. Hey, that job's finished. Let's turn them back down. And I pay for each of those separate dials. So it's a super, super powerful capability. And then cross-region snapshot copy has gone GA. So I can create incremental snapshots of a point in time view of my disk. It stores it in the most efficient manner, i.e. even if it's on a premium SSD, it's gonna store it on standard hard disk drive. And the incremental nature will only store what's changed, so it's very cost effective. Well, now what I can do is I can actually copy that snapshot to another region via a job for additional resiliency. On the database side, Cosmos DB now has always encrypted in GA. SQL has had this for a while. It's the idea that the encryption actually takes place on the client side. So it's always encrypted when it's on the database. So I have to have now this special client side driver as part of this offering. And then the data is just encrypted on the client machine. Well, that means even if I'm a DBA, I cannot see the data in the database. Now, just like SQL always encrypted, there are two types of encryption. There's deterministic, where for the same original value, I'll get the same encrypted value. This lets me do certain types of filtering queries because, hey, I can still determine what those values might have been based on my query. Or there's randomized. The same original will have different encrypted values. It stops me doing certain types of filtering and queries against the database. So. That's now GA. Cosmos DB also has a partition key advisor in preview. Partition keys are everything. If I think about, I shard my data, I split my data up, how I split that up and what key I pick is really critical when I think about getting a good balance across the different partitions, shards. But also when I run queries, ideally, I wanna try and have my query only hitting a certain part of it, so I spend less request units. That's what I pay for with Cosmos DB. So now this advisor will actually go and look at, hey, the sharding of my data, um, how we operate against the data, and give guidance via a notebook on what are the right partition keys to use. PostgreSQL Hyperscale, so remember this is based on Citus, now has FedRAMP High certification. So I don't have to use GovCloud just because I need FedRAMP High. It's just there in regular commercial, like many other offerings in Azure. SQL migration um, is now available via PowerShell and CLI. So if I think about, hey, we have this whole SQL migration extension for Azure Data Studio that works with the Azure Database Migration Service, well, I can now operate against that extension using both PowerShell and CLI. Windows authentication for SQL managed instance with Azure AD accounts. Now I covered this a while ago and I created a whole video on it. Azure AD now supports Kerberos. Seems bizarre. Well, SQL managed instance is now using this capability. So I can have Windows integrated authentication with my SQL MI against Azure AD. That's gonna really help in those scenarios, hey, I'm trying to migrate into SQL MI, I can carry on using Windows authentication, integrated auth, 
and it will do that against Azure AD using that Kerberos capability now of Azure Active Directory. And again, I did a whole video about that and showed it working against a storage account. SQL Database Granular Restore Process Monitor is in preview. So before, if I was doing a database restore, it kind of said restoring or restored or not started yet. Now what it will actually do is it has a percentage complete. It has an actual percentage complete column as part of my DM operation status. So I can actually go and look at exactly how far along the restore process uh, my job actually is. And then Azure Data Explorer is now a known application in Azure AD. So what that lets me do is I can create conditional access policies targeting the Azure Data Explorer cloud app and specify whatever controls I want to have around that. Hey, maybe I want to do an MFA, maybe it's a certain location, whatever that, that might be, there is now an Azure Data Explorer cloud app in Azure AD that I can use as part of my conditional access. Miscellaneous, so there's going to be a new India South Central region that's been announced that will have availability zone support. Azure Arc now has VMware integration. So it's going to have an Azure Arc resource bridge. This is going to be a virtual appliance that I put into my vSphere environment. And it's going to give me a connection between my vCenter server and Azure. Now this could be regular VMware vSphere on-premises. This could be the Azure VMware solution. And now through Azure Arc and through Azure, I'll be able to do lifecycle management. Um, start VMs, stop VMs, create VMs, resize VMs, delete VMs, and have impact on the guest OS inside those virtual machines. So we now have this nice Azure Arc VMware integration. And then Azure AD custom roles, which were previously only for applications before, they're the only permissions I could add as part of a custom role, they've added now device support. So now I could also maybe do things like BitLocker, I could create a custom role. And if we actually go and have a look super quickly, so if I was to jump over, I always have to really try and do one demo at least. So now if I was gonna go and look at my roles and I was gonna go and add a new custom role and look at permissions, it still says, hey, app registration and enterprise apps are supported, but now I could, for example, do things around BitLocker, BitLocker key management. So I might create a role that only supports BitLocker. And the other nice change they've made is, well, maybe I don't want this to apply to everything, every device in my Azure AD. I just want a subset of devices. Well, how do we target roles to a subset of users or groups today in Azure AD? Well, we use administrative units. So also as part of this, they've now added device support. So I could now add devices into an administrative unit and then those custom roles I create with device permissions, I can assign to people at that administrative unit level. So that's really a new capability, again, in preview right now, but that's been added and you could go and try that out. So I wanna give certain people the ability to manage certain aspects of devices, but just a certain group of devices. And that's it, uh, a lot. As always, I hope this was useful and until next video, take care.